welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything, only from jasonhartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Leif Simon back to the show. He is the co-founder of Live and Invest Overseas, and we're going to be talking about some overseas real estate opportunities, some business opportunities, and of course the uh, problem and the uh, backdrop and the context as to uh, why someone would want to consider any of these things. Leif, welcome back. How are you? Uh, I'm great. Uh, thanks for having me, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Well, pleasure is all mine. You know, first of all, I mean, obviously the listeners are interested in this topic because that's why they're listening. <laughs> but just give a, a, a brief outline as to your view of the world now. I assume most of your clientele is uh, probably American or at least North American. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, I'd say probably 80, 85 percent of our, our readers are uh, from North America and the rest maybe from North America, but living in other parts of the world, but they're all English speaking. And from a, from a why go overseas perspective, why, why would you buy property in another country? For me, there, I guess there's a couple aspects. One, you could just do it for the pure adventure. And if you wanted you know, to have a vacation home on the beach, you could buy a cheaper beach home, beach condo in Panama, for example, than you could in you know, Santa Monica. But for me as an investor, uh, it's about diversification, and we, you know, in 2008, when the world real estate market collapsed, they all didn't collapse at the same rate. You know, Ireland and Spain went, you know, down as low as 50, 60 percent uh, from their peaks, but Panama, for example, over went down slowly and maybe dropped 20 to 25 percent over the course of a few years after the after the main uh, markets collapsed. And it's mostly bounced back at this point, whereas, again, you know, to use Ireland and Spain as the example, most of those uh, local markets are still down, although you know, Dublin has uh, recovered a bit. So diversification um, both in markets but also in currencies. So I've invested in you know, places like Brazil and, and Europe to get some cur- currency diversification and some cash flow in the local currencies, sometimes you know, for the purpose of having cash flow in a country that I like to travel to. And when you do that, talk a little bit about how you structure that. I mean, for example, you, you mentioned Brazil. So you buy a property in Brazil, say the property has cash flow, which is great. You open a Brazilian bank account. Do you form a Brazilian entity or just buy it in your personal name? I said you open a bank account, assuming you do, uh, right. I, you know, in Brazil. I don't know if you do. Just kind of give a little backdrop as to how you, how you structure the whole thing. Sure, and really it's going to depend country by country and also person by person, but the country is going to be the key factor to start with. In some countries, for example, they don't charge capital gains tax on real estate profits if you hold the property in your own name. So in Croatia, for example, if you own the property for more than three years and it's held in your own name, there's no capital gains tax. So in that case, you're going to put it in your own name even though 
you might prefer to put it into some kind of uh, structure for probate purposes or asset protection. In Brazil, you essentially put it in your own name because putting it into a, a local corporation has high administrative complexities and costs, and even trying to register a foreign corporation has similar complexities and costs, so it's just easier in the case of Brazil. In a place like Panama, almost all locals hold their property in a local corporation for asset protection purposes and historically also for uh, tax purposes because there was no capital gains tax in Panama on shares of a corporation years ago. That's changed since, so fewer people are, are forcing themselves into that corporation holding. And then the main thing I think about is is probate. I own property, I think, at this point in uh, 12 countries still. I bought property over the years in, in, in 21. And so for my kids, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, you don't want them having to go through probate in a dozen countries just to, to get access to the assets. So having a central structure for most people will make sense. You know, set up a, a, a Nevis uh, LLC or uh, a Belize LLC and use that to hold the bulk of your of your properties and then when there's an exception like maybe you have in Brazil or Croatia you you work with that exception but try and consolidate as much as you can and and one of the challenges is setting up that foreign bank account so let me just kind of understand a couple things are you an american citizen i am indeed okay. yes okay and where do you actually live where is your residence at the moment, I'm in Panama. Okay, so uh, now, I've, now I've, that's what's funny about this new class of, uh, and you're not exactly new to this, but there's sort of this fairly new class. I think a lot of it was inspired by, oh, Tim Ferriss and the four-hour work week and this geo-arbitrage concept. It's what, what my show is about here uh, to a right. large extent. But, you know, there's this new class of people like that say, where do you live? Right now, I'm in Panama. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you right. know, that's not the way we used to answer that question, Leif. Right. <laughs> we used to say, oh, I live in the Socialist Republic of California. Um, and, and that was the answer. <laughs> you know, we, I, I right. mean, so I, you're not going to be there that long or what? And we're, here, we're in Panama. This is where we started our, uh, our publishing company. And, and Panama is a good location to run a business and, and find English speaking employees and, and all that stuff. Previous to that, we were in France. And we were working for another publishing company as employees at, at that point, my wife and I. And uh, But when we left and wanted to start our own thing, we knew France wasn't the place to do that between the, the cost of taxes and cost of labor and the hassle of labor, labor there. Um, we looked around the world, and we, we know the world fairly well, and considered both Uruguay and Panama. Ended up in Panama um, for lots of reasons, one of which also is because I have a, a real estate project here. So obviously being in Panama is more conducive to that than being in Uruguay. And long term, though, once we get the business uh, set here with some local uh, middle management, our intention is to go back to Paris. And in fact, we already have a plan in place for that for our son to finish high school. So you're planning to go back to Paris. Now, that's kind of interesting because uh, France, of course, is so socialist and so business unfriendly. Of course, the famous story that was in the media uh, last, I think it was last year, the actor uh, Jean Depardieu, I think that's how you say his name, you know, right. he, he became a Russian citizen for the 13% tax rather than the, what is it, 75% tax of the war on wealth is going on. It's raging in France, <laughs> even worse than it is in the in the States yeah. or any other westernized country. So now how would you go back there and pull that off? What what would be the plan to do that? Well, we're, from a tax perspective, we're structured to, to minimize the taxes. And in, in, with the reality check, part of my background is as a, as a tax accountant, and so I, n I understand taxes in the U.S., but also in the places where we've lived and where we talk about. And France has high tax bans, and that 75% tax, I, I, tax ban I don't think ever kicked in, but if it did, it would have kicked in for people uh, at a million euro mark. So the 75% ban would be on everything you earned over a million euros. So that's an um, income tax. It's an income tax. Yeah. Um, and, but and, when, and, and when, you know, I, obviously, I mean, I think most of my listeners get this without me saying it, but when you're looking for a jurisdiction, whether it be a state by state within the U.S. or whether it be a territory like Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands or it be outside of the United States, you know, you've got to look at many types of taxes. So, uh, you know, for, right. my, for my mom, for example, who is, you know, reasonably wealthy, and she moved from Los Angeles in the Socialist Republic of California, where I grew up, <laughs> uh, and she rather shockingly moved to Alabama. 
And I kept trying to convince her to move to Texas, and, and she's retired. She's got a lot of real estate holdings that she earns income from those. But she says, Jason, I just don't want to pay the property taxes in Texas. And I said, yeah, but right. there's no income tax. And she says, well, I don't really have that. Income is not my big problem. It's, 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 uh, I, I can keep my income sheltered pretty well with my real estate because it's the most tax-favored asset in America. It's got the depreciation, et cetera. But she wants to have her cost of living be low. So, you know, I mean, she's got probably, I don't know, $2.5 million property there, and taxes, property taxes are super low. And then you got to think, of course, well, there's a, a state tax, there's sales tax, there's different types of taxes. So if you're an asset holder but not a huge income earner, you know, if you can structure it that way, you know, hopefully you're both, but maybe you can structure it so that the income doesn't kind of show up, if you will, then maybe a right. place and, like and France could actually you, work, exactly. right? Exactly. You've got to analyze everything when you're looking at wherever you're going to live. Uh, in our case, for France, we, we won't be considered tax residents because we won't be there full time. We'll go back and forth between Paris and Panama, but our son will be there so he can finish, uh, finish school. So, uh, that's uh, not being a, t a tax resident in any one place is one easy way to avoid the situation in, in many countries. Right. And now we have to mention with that, it doesn't help you very much if you're a U.S. citizen, because no matter what, you got to declare all worldwide income, except when right. you live overseas, you get some exemptions. So uh, a friend of mine who's married and he's got a couple of kids and he lives in Eastern Europe, but he's American and you know, he shelters about a first two hundred and thirty grand. He's figured out how to do that. Right. You right. The, yeah, that? That, yeah. That that's through the foreign earned income exclusion, which is I think ninety seven thousand six hundred for two thousand thirteen and ninety nine thousand two hundred. It's indexed. I forget the exact number for two thousand fourteen, and that's for both both spouses. So if both spouses are working, it has to be earned income. So it it doesn't work if you're you know managing a passive real estate portfolio, but but earned income. And then on top of that, if you're renting, you can get a housing exclusion as well for as much as 16% of the, of the uh, foreign earned income exclusion. So that 230,000 figure is, is right on, on the target. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So back to what we were saying. So anything more about tax jurisdiction and, well, you know, here's a question for you. I mean, I, what I kind of have a, a tough time with as I talk to you and Kathleen and the other guests I've had on the show, I'm sure you've considered it, but what what are the thoughts on just relinquishing citizenship and then not having to deal with the IRS at all? Right, and that comes up a lot with our readers and at our conferences, and people ask us why we haven't, because we do have dual citizenship. We lived in Ireland long enough to uh, to obtain a uh, uh, naturalization there, and so we with, could with give no our... With no Irish heritage? With, no, we... we, we, we our, our first move together overseas, Kathy and I, was to Ireland, and so we lived there seven years. And so, after five years of uh, of uh, reckonable residency, as the Irish term they like to use, reckonable, um, you're <laughs> reckonable, yeah. That's a, we can have a discussion about that term later. But uh, uh, as long as you're a, a legal resident for five years, you can apply for naturalization. And so we did, and we have passports. Our son was born there, so he has Irish citizenship. And so people say, why don't you just give up your U.S. citizenship? Well, for us, we, we're structured, so we pay with the foreign earned income exclusion and the way our businesses are structured. We, you know, we pay very little tax. It's either excluded or it's deferred uh, at this point. And long term, we'll have more taxes to pay. And so at the moment, there's no tax advantage. And frankly, I, I like to keep my options open. So if if the rest of the world went to where everybody thinks the U.S. is going, then we have that option to go back to the U.S. And I mean, I can I can make a living in the U.S. You know, if I showed up tomorrow, um, even just preparing people's taxes, if nothing else. So, uh, so defending I like to keep defending that them open. against what their own me, government. <laughs> yeah, it, what makes me consider giving the, the the citizenship up isn't paying taxes; it's the damn filing the the forms. And so I, I have the privilege of sending in 100 pages to the IRS each year to tell them that I owe them little to nothing. That's all? Uh, and Mine, mine's longer than that. <laughs> I can't believe it. I you mean, probably have more rental properties yeah. than, than oh, I do. But, uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's st stressful because and frustrating because it, it is a lot of paperwork and it's a lot of, of uh, administration. 
and to, to literally tell them, I don't owe you anything. Okay, well, very interesting. So do you want to mention, we kind of got off track there a little bit, but I really yeah, appreciate sorry, it. That. I thought that was a spirited discussion, and I, you know, that, I think the listeners learned a lot from that. So just any more on the backdrop of what's going on and why to do this, and then let's leave that subject and talk about some specific opportunities and things that you're working on. Sure. Well, I would, I would just say, you know, historically there are better opportunities in, in different countries at different times. So back to that diversification thought, you know, if you're, if, uh, you're, you're looking for really low-cost properties with eventually potential capital gains appreciation, they're, they're, you know, Ireland and Spain are a place to look at probably later this year uh, in certain markets. So while the U.S. Ha- had its fall and markets are coming back, if you have all of your eggs in, in, in one basket in the U.S., you're, you're just at, at risk for even a localized economic drop in, in a particular state. Right. But the only thing, in, in fairness to the U.S., I mean, the U.S. Is, is not one housing market or one real estate market. It's about 400 markets. I mean, it's a huge, right. diverse country. So what happens in California is completely different than what happens in Texas. <laughs> you know. it, it, exactly. Yeah. But you're still all in dollars. So that's, that's the currency yeah, you, side. You, you still have the currency best. thing. But, uh, you know, you can buy houses with Bitcoin. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe I should start having my tenants pay me in gold or Bitcoin or something. I don't know. <laughs> Might be an option. Might I'm, I'm, I'm kind of joking. So, uh, very interesting. And, and so Spain, I don't know much about the Irish market, but I was in Spain last year. I was in Croatia last year, last summer. And how close do you think we are to the bottom in, in Spain, for example? I mean, there's been a lot written about Spain. I, I, I'm reading your stuff about it. Yeah. Where, where do you, where it, do you think that market is? Well, and, and again, Spain isn't just one market either. And so the, the place to look in Spain right now, according to all of our contacts on the ground and that know Spain better than I do at this point, is – is is not the costas, not where you're going to find the cookie cutter homes that are, there's a thousand of that's been repossessed. Um, personally, I would I would I like Barcelona, and I would focus on uh, Barcelona or any other place that has some cachet. And so, you know, Barcelona prices came down not as much as as some of the costas, um, but you can get a decent rental yield in Barcelona and and get better prices today than you could a few years ago. Also, is it is it time to pull the trigger there yet, or are you or you want to wait it, a little longer? It's it seems like it's getting close, according to what everybody is saying, and uh, and so yeah, I'd say Barcelona sooner rather than later, because that market's going to come back faster than other places. If you want something on the costa, Costa del Sol or Costa del Luz, buy on the beach. Don't buy two blocks back. Buy on the beach because those properties will always have better value and better appreciation than uh, than something that's uh, that's not sitting on the water. So, Leif, can I share my thoughts about Barcelona? It was kind of interesting sure. for me to go there. I, you know, I was there uh, for a while last, uh, maybe August, September, and I was not impressed. That was my second trip there. I did look at real estate there. I looked in two markets. I looked in Barcelona, and then I went much further south to where the Saudis seem to be buying up the country, and it's extremely expensive, but... I thought it was quite a bit nicer. But like Barcelona now, I, at first the first impression I have of the Spaniards is they just don't want to work. I mean, this whole concept of siestas <laughs> and, you know, uh, very, very lazy. Uh, I'm sorry to offend uh, if I'm offending. Maybe they're proud of that. But, right. uh, man, they are living La Dolce Vita, not the Italians. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they just, I don't know how that economy is going to come back except for possibly tourism. But I can't well, say they're bending over backwards for tourism. They're just about as haughty as the French. And the city is covered with graffiti. I mean, there's lots of litter. There's lots of crime. I don't know. You know, I just, I was, yeah, I thought that place had gone downhill since my my prior visit. But feel free well, that, to disagree with me. Well, that that's, that's interesting. And I can't disagree completely because I, I was there last summer, but just for a day because it was a, the end port for a cruise that we were on, and so we were just along the uh, the Las Ramblas and the and the uh, the Malacan, you know, along the water, and it was, I mean, it was it was just Barcelona in, in, in those areas. It was you know, lots of tourists and and none of what you were talking about. I didn't get into some of the other areas where one might buy a, a short term rental apartment. The the market in Barcelona, you're right. It's going to be more and more tourism. And that's, you know, and, I wish I'd it's, bought there. It's, it's tourism like nightclub tourism. It's like young people that are drinking a lot, 
partying a lot. There's a lot of that tourism there. And I, sure. I just I just was struck by the graffiti and the uh, it just seemed like a very economically devastated place. Right. Well, and I mean, I guess my opinion, having lived in Europe and you know, lived in Paris, is everybody has a different uh, perspective, you know, even on Paris. They either love it or they hate it. But for Barcelona, it's kind of a, it's, it's a classic destination that is growing from a tourism perspective over the last, say, 15 years. And with better access, especially to, to Northern Europe with the, uh, the TGV uh, coming down now. And so I think yields and long-term stability of prices, if not outright appreciation, should, should be okay. But right, you, when you're buying overseas, you, you want to buy in a place that you like going to. So even if the numbers are great and you don't like going there, you, you're better off not buying because then you're not going to want to go there to manage it or deal with, uh, deal with anything. Right, right. And, and then the other issue you've got is the larger geopolitical issue of, you know, look, at Greece has basically collapsed. Spain, Portugal, Italy are next in line, maybe Ireland. Uh, what do you think about that, just about the general issue of total country problems, uh, you know, not, not specific areas? Right. Well, yeah, Europe has similar economic issues as, as the U.S. I mean, you can, you know, each country is, you can relate to a state in the U.S. And certainly, I was in Greece last summer as well, and I wouldn't touch real estate in Greece with the 10-foot pole because I don't see any compelling reason why you can get a decent yield or see capital appreciation in the bulk of that country. Maybe on some of the the high-end tourist islands, you might find something that's worthwhile. And so, it's country by country, area within country. You've got to pay attention to what's going on. But the you know the bottom line is that anywhere in the world at any point in time, you know you or I could go show up and, and find a really great investment um, if you put enough time in. But that doesn't mean that the overall economics of, of the area makes sense long term to, to take that to take that risk, even though you're getting a great deal on a specific property. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, so uh, speaking of uh, great deals, I mean. What are you working on personally? You're developing in uh, Panama, I believe, right? I, I am developing in Panama. This, that's a, more of a, a residential community on the coast, uh, the Azuero Peninsula. And so it's, it's less for investment and more for, you know, second, second home and retiree type of people. Well, yeah. And from the investment side of things, what I've been looking at for the last three or four years intently since, you know, capital appreciation is in the wind in most places is anything that can generate a yield. So maybe that's a rental property in Medellin, Colombia. We, we bought a property there ourselves and know lots of people have bought properties there the last few years. And uh, you know, three years ago, you could get even as high as a 20% yield on a, on a short-term rental property there. Prices have gone up and rentals has come down, but you're still in the, you know, that five to 8% net range, which isn't too bad, and have some capital appreciation expectation in Medellin. And then agricultural, turnkey agricultural projects is where we're I'm focusing, trying to find things for our readers. And the, the one that's uh, at the forefront right now is a mango plantation opportunity here in Panama, where the developer finds the land, plants the mango trees, and then manages the, the plantation as a whole. But each individual investor owns their own titled plot of land with their own trees on it. So you have the security of, of owning the property, but don't have the hassle of having to actually farm or manage the, the trees yourself. And what kind of yields uh, are investors getting on something like that? I mean, are those, and is any of this real estate leverageable or is it all, you know, just pay 100% cash? I'll answer the second part first because it's shorter, I think. In, in most countries, you're not going to be able to get financing as a non-resident foreigner. Panama, it's possible if you put down 40, 50, 60%. Uh, so you could buy a rental apartment in Panama, put 50% down and get a, and get a local bank loan if you qualify otherwise, the standard, you know, debt to income ratios, all that. Europe, you used to be able to get financing as a non-resident foreigner a little bit easier, obviously with the, the collapse and banking issues there. Um, it's harder. In fact, I'm in the process of buying another apartment in Paris right now and have been trying to get financing for, say, 50 percent just because I think the euro is too high right now uh, and I'd rather borrow euros than, than transfer dollars into euros. But none of the banks, uh, one bank, that we found would do a non-resident loan, but they, but not for me because I work for my own company. If I worked for somebody else, they would have given me the loan. So, Leaf, what kind of yields can investors expect on the mango farm, for example? Well, the 
it's it's all new plantings. So the the yields will start once the trees start producing. They start producing in year three, and then full production in year four. And so the annual cash returns in year four are in the 25 to 26 percent range. But obviously you've got to you got to back out the years that you're not getting anything. So an annualized return using a 15 year time period is like in the 16 percent range. And they feel those numbers are fairly conservative because the prices that they're putting in for mangoes is the very low end of today's market. And the interesting thing in Panama is that Pan Panama grows mangoes, but they, the processing plants here actually import 80% of what they process from other countries, Ecuador, Brazil, or wherever, because there's not enough mangoes growing in Panama. So they, they feel that the, the sales side of the equation is, is very strong. So, you know, I mean, I've had promoters that are selling, you know, coffee plantations in Colombia and so forth uh, approach me and talk to me about it. And I'm kind of wondering, why is it that the person owns the real estate rather than just investing in the business? Well, there's, there's a couple things. One, there's, there's uh, if selling shares of a company to Americans, you have SEC requirements. You'd have to file a, a Reg D right. documentation and all that. And then you can only bring in accredited investors. But the other part of it, at least for our readers, is they, they want to hold the hard asset, right? So if, if the, the management company managing the plantation goes bust or gets hit by a bus or whatever, you still own the, your own piece of property and can do something with that. So I think that just gives people a, a better feeling that they have a hard as, asset, especially out of their home jurisdiction, that, that Uncle Sam can't come and, and you know, just pluck out of their bank account. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And what, I mean, how do you know that the manager is really going to manage it, really going to stick with it, do a good job? I mean, is there enough money in it for them as a renewing, uh, you know, accruing type of income that's just sort of becomes an annuity for them? Or are they just sort of like they do the real estate deal and that's their big windfall? And then after that, you know, they're, they're going to lose interest. That would be well, my it depends. Yeah, it depends on how they structure it, but um, you want them to structure it in a way that their interests are aligned with yours. And so the groups that we uh, deal with, that, that's what they do. So in the case of the mango plantation, um, you know, on the, on the income from the produce that's harvested, uh, the investor gets 70% and they get 30% for doing the management and all the work and everything. Um, and so that, that's a pretty nice chunk of change once you get up to several hundred or a thousand hectares that they're managing. Um, it turns into a real business for them that they, they uh, want to maintain. Anything else you want to mention in closing uh, that I maybe forgot to ask or just any other any other items? Uh, well, there's lots of things we could talk about, it seems like. But uh, just to, if you don't mind, we, uh, I can mention we have a, a real estate conference coming up here in Panama in April. And uh, we'll be having a lot of the investment opportunities that we write about there in person, plus a lot of the, the residential opportunities in the various countries as, as well. And we'll have uh, some sessions that are more kind of real estate offshore 101 sessions. So it'll be a good learning experience for people. Fantastic. Give out your website, if you would. Sure. It's uh, liveandinvestoverseas.com. And uh, we also have uh, free e-letters that people can sign up for if they just want to uh, learn a little bit more about what we talk about. Fantastic. Well, Leif Simon, thank you so much for joining us today, and happy investing. Great. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.